in honor of hundreds, dare I say thousands? Probably not thousands, probably hundreds of veterinary students across the nation taking their North American veterinary licensing exam, better known as the NAVLI. We're like in solidarity with you. In solidarity with you. <laughs> uh, Dr. Tanasia Crocker and I uh, are going to go through some sample questions from the NAVLI. More specifically, I'm going to quiz Dr. Crocker with some sample questions from the NAVLI. And we're going to see if she has retained information from when she took the NAVLI in... 2009, so 14, 14 years ago. Yeah, I took it 14 years ago. It's been a while, um, and I was equine. So like, I was definitely more like focused yeah. on that, you know? Yeah. So first of all, Dr. Crocker, thank you for being here. Yes, I don't quite know how you talked me into this, but I am very excited. Yeah, you're very brave. <laughs> I've done this before with my two, or sorry, with my middle brother, who is a physician, and okay. he actually got a few of these right, being a human medicine radiologist, which is pretty impressive. But I have selected random questions from the Zuku Review. Harrison, you can put a little graphic up here of the Zuku Review. This is what I used 14 years ago to prepare myself for this exam. If you're a vet student or a want-to-be vet student, you'll see kind of how Dr. Crocker goes through this and goes through the choices. Uh, Dr. Dr. Crocker, are you ready for the first question? I am ready. Okay. I am sweating, but I am ready. A horse, I'm already out, is uh, presented in severe respiratory distress in Southern California after a suspected snake bite. There okay. is significant nasal swelling, as you see below, flared nostrils, abdominal movement with each breath, strider and tachypnea, aside from local tissue damage and associated upper airway obstruction. What is another major complication? of crotalid envenomation. You have options A, immune suppression, B, chronic visual impairment, C, diarrhea, D, coagulopathy, E, acute hepatic necrosis. So I actually did my internship in uh, California. So I saw a fair amount of these. We used to cut like tubing and we would actually put it up their noses and like tape it in. So when they swelled a lot, they could still breathe. So we had a ton of these, but I'm gonna go with D, coagulopathy. Is that the one you would have picked also? Yes. And that is the correct answer. Yes. Congratulations. And one little tip, just if there are vet students watching this, you do see it in dogs. And if you're not certain, like if the owners aren't sure if there was a bite or not, it, the changes in the red blood cells are pretty quick. So a blood smear is like a cheap and easy thing to do if an owner's unsure of what happened uh, to look for kinocytes. So we do that a fair amount in the ER, especially if there's financial constraints, is maybe we don't run full labs right away. We'll check for kinocytes first before we go down the road of like a full workup and treatment and all the things. Question number two. An eight-month-old male intact German Shepherd dog is presented for poor weight gain, chronic diarrhea, and polyphagia. Fasting, serum, trypsin light immunoreactivity, better known as TLI, better known as I ask an internist what to do. Uh, measurement <laughs> is less than 2.0 micrograms per milliliter and the normal range is as you see there. What is the most likely cause of this dog's clinical signs? A, pituitary dwarfism, B, acute pancreatitis, C, inflammatory bowel disease, D, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, or E, acinar cell atrophy. Did you get this one correct? I did. Okay, so, I want to say my process of elimination. I got it. Correct. Yeah, I was I was going to say I want to say mainly because of the breed. So, you know, they always have the triggers. So it's German right. Shepherd. Um, so I would say E, Asinar cell atrophy because they have a deficiency. OK. No. Yeah, that's right. Now you're making me say yes. <laughs> yeah, the answer is, in fact, E, acinar cell atrophy. So common in German Shepherds. So yes. if you see German Shepherd and TLI, that's what you're going with. Don't even read the whole question. All right, so you're two for two. Whew. Okay, there okay. We go. All right. Drink some more coffee. This is question three. Dr. Crocker is two for two. We're on question three. A nine-year-old male neutered German Shepherd, another German Shepherd, is presented with unchecked bleeding from a cut on the gums above the right canine tooth. The owner relates that the dog has lost weight and had an episode of collapse three days ago, but he recovered. On physical exam, the gums are pale with petechia and ecomotic hemorrhages. There's tachycardia and a palpable cranial abdominal mass. Hmm. The coagulation profile shows the following. These were always my least favorite questions in all of veterinary school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Coag profiles, dear God. The coag profile shows the following. Thrombocytes, 82,000 some odd, normal range, as you see there. So the thrombocytes are a little low. A buccal mucosal bleeding time is increased. Dr. Crocker, can you explain what that is just for the people that don't know what that yeah is. so uh when you 
get a cut, you should clot within a certain amount of time. And so one quick and easy test you can do to check and see clotting times is actually to check the gums and actually make a little cut or this dog obviously had something. Um, And it should clot within a short amount of time. I don't remember the exact time right now off the top of my head. Um, But if it doesn't, it means that there is something wrong with the coagulation cascade in the pet. Is it like two minutes? I thought it was like yeah, I was gonna. Say, I was gonna say like ninety seconds. So I think it's something around yeah, there. Somewhere around there. His APTT is increased. His prothrombin time PT is increased, and his fibrin degradation products are increased. What disorder of coagulation bets fits? fits this pattern? I thought this was the hardest question. I was going to say, I feel like this is hard. So let me just talk through some things and you tell me what you think. One, I would automatically take off on Willebrams because one, the breed, and then also the age. Uh, Usually I would say this would present younger. That's something you're born with. Yes. Two, I would probably take off rodenticide toxicity. A lot of times if we see that it's mainly like PTT and PT that are increased initially. And not to say it couldn't be that, I just don't feel like it goes with that. The other thing is hepatic insufficiency is a possibility because that's where you store a lot of your coagulation uh, factors. I'm a little torn on the idiopathic thrombocytopenia because I would say 82,000 is not that low. Like to get spontaneous bleeding from thrombocytopenia, I'm usually I think it's less than like 20,000. And so my big thing would be because there's a a mass, I'm worried that this dog has like a splenic mass or a liver mass, possibly has DIC from having neoplasia. I don't know. Did you get this one correct? Yeah, but it was it was a guess out of three. Like I'm not gonna sit here and Are you are you trying to like hide your hide like your response to my no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. I I, I'm trying to like read you as I'm saying stuff. Okay, so I could be wrong, but I'm gonna go with a DIC. You are correct. Yeah. I'm not going to I'm not going to make you sweat that one out after all that. That was a tough question, but yeah. It was. Um that's one of those questions where you've got to go through everything. You do. To rule it out. And I think the big thing is that literally everything is increased as far as like the coagul everything's just completely like mm-hmm. abnormal here. And DIC is the one out of all of these where like everything's going to be just completely you know, yeah. out of whack and either low or high, depending on what makes you bleed. So yeah. And the um, mass, the mass too. So right. like it says in there that you can see it with like hemangiosarcoma because we do see that in the ER a fair amount. And so it is good to know that like chronic. Yeah, turns out you see that a few times as an ER doctor. Yeah. yeah. Just a couple <laughs> yeah. per shift. No. Yeah. All right. I, I cool. feel like. I feel a little better. I've gotten you're, you're on a roll. 50%. There's, there's one of these. If you get this, I, I don't know if it's next, but if you get one of these, you'll know when you see it. I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna, I'll be impressed. Okay. Okay. So Dr. Crocker is three for three. Another thing about this test too is you've got to do it like a, there, it's like only so much time you can allocate to every yes. question. So stuff like this you've got to really be efficient with. I took a lot of test taking classes. Never go back and change answers if you don't know the question just go with your gut and move on. Don't dwell on a question for like five, 10 minutes. You will, it will not help you. And keywords are like the big thing with the NAVLI. Like I think a hundred percent, you will see the same question over and over with different variations. And if you just know those keywords, like you don't, you can just go through and your mind will be like, okay, it's telling me this. This is the one. Are you ready for some fish? No, no. (laughs) All this left my brain as soon as I walked out of the testing center. I'm sure you see trout many times in the ER. All the time. I I just did an MRI in a trout yesterday. Very Um, cool. Wait, what was wrong with the trout? Um, no, I, 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 I can't even make up a joke. I don't even know what, what trout get. A parasite. I don't know. <laughs> On to the question. A trout okay. fishery reports that many of the fish have gray, white, puffy growths on their fins, gills, and eyes. A direct smear from the affected tissues shows the following findings, images below. What action should you take to address the top differential? So like, what is in the picture? I can't, it looks like a very bad impression smear. This is what the trout look like. Okay. Right. This one doesn't look like he's doing too good. No, no it's not neither, gonna make it. Neither does this one. My professional opinion <laughs> is it's not gonna make it. Um, I'm gonna say you don't pour formalin in with the fish. Okay. Probably doesn't make sense. It is interesting that there's two that have to deal with supplements. So like, there's vitamin C and zinc. This is like I have no idea, and I'm purely trying to use my test taking. No clue. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Depopulation. I feel like a lot of these questions that have to do with like herd health that's actually like an adequate possibility especially if <laughs> right. a lot of them 
Fisher affected. <laughs> but the only thing that's weird is we have a smear, right? So praziquantel is used to treat for parasites. So I'm like, is there a parasite on this slide here that I should know? And that would be the treatment, but I don't see anything really on there. I'm probably between depopulation and then one of the like supplementing or something. Cause I think it's either you either like need to give vitamins or you need to kill them all. Those are my two. <laughs> that's that's, that's kind of how these like herd population things go, yeah. which isn't funny. We shouldn't laugh about that. No, it's not. It's funny in the sense that like, that's an option. Like that's a yeah. valid option on the test. I'm going to go with depopulation. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just pulling the plug. I'm just going with it. <laughs> Depopulation is the just only start appropriate over. measure. It is treat with formalin. See, like in what world would you be like, yeah, I'm gonna dump formalin in there. You treat the fish with formalin, uh, <sighs> hydrogen peroxide or potassium permanganate because this infection is caused by sapro saprolegnia, saprolenia. It is a saprophytic fungus and technically it's an o o o I can't even, oomycete water mold. Okay. The more I talk, the more stupid I'm going to sound with these things. <laughs> this is, I mean, okay, so you could see, you could see the long filaments on the, on the. So I think what this was, was a fungus. This is like yeah. fungal branching. I, think. I mean, if you tell me that I could make that, I could make that be the case, but I've never yeah. looked at a fish cytology. Yeah. But I can remember. I think you're, uh, you're three for four. A stray dog is presented after being hit by a car. The dog has hypotonic forelimbs and spastic paresis in the hinds. First of all, the hinds. They need to change yeah. that to hind limbs, yes. not the hinds. All four limbs have proprioceptive deficits and sensation loss. Signs are worse in the forelimbs. Where's okay. the lead? I got a lot of problems with this question, but. First, for people who are not aware, hypotonic forelimbs means what? Uh, hypotonic means like a, a flaccid dish rag, sort of just like flimsy, no tone. Yeah, yeah. And or low tone, I should say. Bastic paresis would be, they can't, feel or move rigid. the back legs, but they're rigid, right? Rigid. Everything's okay. stuck. You, you you press on their leg to try to push it in and it resists you. Yeah. And then the way I explain proprioceptive deficits to owners is the signals getting from the legs, the brain and back again, there's a disruption somewhere. But the fact that it's more affected in the forelimbs and the hind is the key here because it has to be in the area that controls the forelimbs that's most severely affected. Yeah, so right off the bat, you can rule out two. Lumbosacral and thoracolumbar. But then you have two cervical ones. I would be inclined to say C. I can't say it's not D because D would maybe give me a better idea of which one. Or Because if it was E, you wouldn't have the, the worsening in the four limbs, I wouldn't think. I feel like it'd be the same. You're judging me hard. I know, right I'm now. not judging. I'm just going to so give you the answer. I'm feeling so much pressure right now. I'm going with C. Final answer. C, cervical thoracic. And you would be correct. Let's go. go. So I got to turn my neurologist brain off a little bit. I can think of all these different scenarios that's going to make everything out just go out the window here. Right. But the bottom line is what they're trying to tell you is that you've got low tone in the forelimbs. And if you've got decreased tone, you've got like lower motor neuron signs, basically. And so you have to be at the level of the intumescence of the forelimbs. Yes, there's clinical scenarios where a C1, C5 could make this dog look exactly the same. I've seen it, but they're not getting that detailed. You have to tell yourself during the NAVLI that it's really not trying to trick you. Like they're right. giving you the info you need to pick the most obvious answer. Great Thank job you. reducing down the localization. All right, you are four for five. And I believe this is the last question. I could be wrong. I think I'm, I'm gonna pass no matter what at this point, but- Yeah, I mean, your board like, certification depends on it. So let's bring I bring it so. home. Okay. Uh, question number, what are we on, number six? six. Yeah. Number six, all right. Yes. A couple of days ago, a client brought an 18 month old filly home from a kill pen, was headed for Mexico for slaughter. She just sent you photos of the horse showing thick bilateral mucopurulent nasal discharge and a swollen throat lap. She says that the, I, I feel like I'm, I'm on the news. She says that the horse's breathing is stertorous and loud. You're on your way to see the horse thinking you will need to do an emergency tracheotomy first thing. What are additional preliminary recommendations based on the top differential? Uh, you see a picture of a horse with a uh, large swelling under its uh, jaw, TMJ region. Yeah, what are the additional preliminary recommendations based off what you think this is? A, you start antimicrobials, limit iodine intake, measure thyroid, check for goiter. B, quarantine the horse and take temperatures on all the other horses. 
is C, pass a nasal gastric tube to treat esophageal obstruction. D, refer for laser ablation treatment for guttural pouch tympani. E, we'll need to biopsy the mass if the owner wants to proceed with chemotherapy. So this is a, this is a good case. I know the answer, but I'm gonna go through my thought process just in case people watching wanna know. So a couple things, it's a young horse, right? So right off the bat, I'm probably not going to think it's E, it's any sort of mass. I think the key on here is the bilateral nasal discharge, the bilateral swelling. So this horse most likely has strangles, which is an infection of the guttural pouches internally and they fill up with pus and so from the outside you can see it so an infectious disease i'm going to be worried about it being in a pen with a lot of other horses i don't think it's an esophageal obstruction that usually presents differently you wouldn't have swelling both sides of the neck the guttural pouch uh tympany is not like infection but it, i think this is a guttural pouch issue so i would probably say B, quarantine the horse and take temps on all the other horses because strangles is highly, highly infectious. You are correct, as it turns out. Okay, last one. You're, you got an 83, you're five for six. A finishing farm has pigs that are about 12 weeks old. The farmer is noticing that about 10% of the pigs are failing to thrive. They have yellow watery diarrhea. They are emaciated and dying, even if treated with antibiotics. Affected pigs are pale to icteric. Exam reveals enlarged inguinal lymph nodes. Well, that helps. What yeah, is the cause yeah. of evasion? I didn't know this at all. I got this one wrong. Obviously a virus because of the fact that it's not responding to antibiotics. Well, that um, and every, every choice is a virus. So there's a virus. Also <laughs> Listen, listen, I was thinking that before. So if I go off of other viruses that we know of in other species, I would say it's not herpes. For some reason, the paramyxio virus is standing out to me, but then maybe that was like a chicken thing. So I'm getting it confused. Yeah. Parvovirus would be something like this potentially in like a dog or a cat or a dog, but not pig that I know of. And then circovirus also sounds like it could be a bird i honestly don't know i would say it's between b d and e but just because paramyxio virus like stood out to me i'm gonna go with that one but it is a 100 percent complete guess paramyxovirus it's yeah. actually a circovirus post weaning multi-systemic wasting syndrome okay when i tell you i've never heard of this in my entire <laughs> life I've never heard of this in my entire life. I, thought I don't think I even heard about it in veterinary school. I think it might be like, I thought it was a chicken respiratory virus, so yeah. I definitely yeah. didn't. So I think you got six, uh, five out of seven. That's still passing. Uh, that's pretty good considering you haven't done anything with fish ever and never once uh, practiced with pigs in like, what, 10 years? Something yeah. like that? That is a score that is good enough for you to pass the Navli and good enough for you to continue being a veterinarian. How Thank do you, you. feel? Thank you. I feel I feel great. I um, yeah. I appreciated you giving me this opportunity. No, yeah. <laughs> I uh, I actually am glad I got all the small animal ones correct, and the equine yeah. ones. Or else it would have felt really, you know, would have been like if you missed a neurology one, you would have been like, what the? Yeah. I'm like, oh God. I, well, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't have made the question and that wouldn't be on the video. I can tell you that right now. Yeah, you're like, we're not doing this one. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll never do this We'll never live. know. <laughs> we'll never know if you ever missed it. That's all funny. right. Wanted to wish all the students out there best of luck taking your yes. navalies. It will be okay. Even if you don't pass it, you'll still be okay. You retake it, you will eventually pass it. I always tell people, no one ever asks you after you graduate. What'd you get on the Navli? How many times did it take you to pass? So you will get over that yeah. eventually and you'll be a great veterinarian. Dr. Crocker, do you have anything to plug? If you enjoyed this, uh, make sure obviously that you check out more of your stuff on YouTube and social media. Oh, wow. um, and then, a reverse plug, thank you. And then <laughs> I also have a podcast, uh, Questions with Crocker, that you can check out. And you actually, did you hear that your episode with me is one of my top episodes so far? So, I did not. I did not hear that. But yeah. uh, but thank you. I'm glad yeah. I could. I'm glad I could uh, add some value, as they say in social media world. Yeah. Um, all right. This is pretty fun. I hope you had fun. Uh, it was doing great. This. All right. Cool. Great. And anybody watching this, if uh, you want to come on the show and do it, I'm happy to do any any Navli quizzing with you. All right, guys. Like and subscribe. Leave a comment. Let me know what you think. And we'll see you on the next video. Appreciate it.